They weren't wild-haired brutes, club in hand, growling in a cave. They didn't drag their wives by the hair. They didn't tear raw meat with their teeth like wild animals. And they were anything but stupid. Yet for centuries, the image of the caveman has been distorted, turned into a symbol of ignorance, of a time before civilization. Somehow, we've grown used to imagining the past as dark and backward, and Paleolithic humans as creatures not yet fully evolved. The truth couldn't be more different. Modern archaeology is peeling back those layers of prejudice, sharpened tools with refined edges, wooden spears perfectly balanced for throwing, and deep cave paintings filled with abstraction. All of it points to one undeniable fact. They didn't just survive. They understood, they crafted, they created, and they learned. Now imagine dropping a modern person, university degree, fluent in three languages, iPhone in hand, into the wilderness with nothing. He'd starve, dehydrate, or get eaten within days. But our prehistoric ancestors, they survived ice ages. They migrated thousands of kilometers. They healed with roots and herbs. They raised children, built tools, understood natural rhythms, and left behind a legacy that echoes through millions of years. That's not savagery. That's the peak of adaptation. And it's not ignorance. It's survival genius. Part 2. 99% of human history belongs to this era. If human history were a 100-page book, the chapter we're living in right now would only be the final page. Everything we usually call history, from the pyramids and the Roman Empire to the internet and space exploration, makes up less than 1% of our story. The remaining 99% of human existence belongs to the Paleolithic era. From 2.6 million years ago to around 12,000 years ago, this was a time without agriculture, without governments, without books, without money. And yet, it was during this era that humans discovered fire, crafted tools, painted cave walls, tamed the wild, and shaped the roots of spiritual life. We didn't just learn to survive. We began to dream. Homo habilis, the handyman. Homo erectus, the upright man. Neanderthals, builders of stone and bone shelters. Denisovans, rulers of the frozen Asian highlands. And finally, Homo sapiens, the one who thinks. Each of them represents a grand opening chapter that modern history books often skip over. Not because they weren't important, but because they didn't write in ink. They carved their legacy into stone, into bone, and into memory. We didn't begin with cities. We began with footprints in the sand, sparks in the dark, and whispers echoing in the caves. The sound of a species learning for the very first time what it means to be human. Part 3. A day that begins with fire and survival. No Google Calendar. No deadlines. But every day for a Paleolithic human was a race against death, where a single mistake could cost everything. Mornings didn't begin with an alarm, but with the sound of wind rustling through animal hide roofs, the soft crackle of embers, and the smell of smoke soaked into fur and skin. The first person to wake would stir the coals from the night before, the fire that must never be allowed to die. Because without fire, they'd lose warmth, light, food, and protection from predators. At Terra Amada in France, archaeologists uncovered hearts that had been carefully maintained for years, fixed in place inside shelters, surrounded by ash, charcoal, and charred bones. After fire came water. Someone would walk to the nearest stream, river, or pool, fetching water with animal bladders, shells, or hide pouches, Another would check traps for animals caught overnight. A few others sharpened spears, reshaped stone blades, preparing for the hunt ahead. No shouting. No orders. Everyone knew what had to be done. There were no bosses. Only the pressing logic of survival. And when the sun rose high enough, the hunters departed. Spears in hand. Ears tuned to the rustle of leaves the crunch of distant hooves, the breath of prey just out of sight. Because they knew, tonight's dinner, or the entire week's survival, was being decided in that very moment. Part 4. 
hunting was a deadly art. Don't picture our ancestors as wild men running across a plain, yelling as they blindly hurled spears at animals. They didn't hunt by instinct, they hunted by strategy, with memory, patience, and finely honed skills passed down through generations. At Boxgrove, England, archaeologists uncovered a horse shoulder blade with a deep puncture wound, powerful and precise enough to kill instantly. Not a random strike, but a carefully aimed blow delivered after tracking, stalking, and waiting for the right moment. At Schoningen, Germany, nearly 300,000-year-old wooden spears were found, almost two meters long, made from spruce trunks, polished and aerodynamically balanced like modern javelins. These weren't primitive sticks. They were engineered weapons, crafted for distance, precision, and lethality. Around 30,000 years ago, early humans developed spear throwers, simple lever tools that doubled throwing range and force. By 20,000 years ago, the bow and arrow emerged, ushering in an era of long-distance hunting with less risk but requiring incredible skill. Still, no matter how advanced the weapon, a hunt was always a gamble. One missed throw meant hunger. One injury meant death. That's why gathering was the backbone of survival. Hunting could fail, but grass, nuts, roots, berries, they returned with the seasons. The kill fed the tribe, but the plants, they kept them alive. Part 6. Shelter was more than just a cave. Since childhood, we've called them cavemen. It sounds fitting, but in truth, that label only tells a small part of the story. Caves, while sturdy, were scarce, damp, dark, and immobile. They weren't permanent homes, they were seasonal shelters, used in winter or during storms. For most of the year, Paleolithic people built their own houses, wherever the land allowed. At Mezerich in Ukraine, over 15,000 years ago, archaeologists uncovered circular dwellings built from mammoth bones, hundreds of them forming frameworks, then covered with animal hides for insulation. At Terra Amata in France, evidence reveals wooden huts up to 15 meters long, with post holes, leveled floors, and a central hearth for warmth and cooking. Inside these homes, there was no chaos. The space was clearly organized, cooking near the fire, sleeping in a separate area. Tool making and flint work had their own space. And importantly, refuse disposal was kept well away from where they lived. Paleolithic humans cleaned, repaired after storms, managed waste and sanitation, just like any functioning society. They didn't live in squalor, despite what movies might show. They didn't settle where it was easiest. They made wherever they lived into a real home. And in that home, they nurtured not just bodies, but the entire community. The fire, the food, the sleep, and the memories that would shape the generations to come. Part 7. A Society of Order, Sharing, and Exchange Prehistoric humans didn't live alone. They lived in groups of 20 to 30 people, often extended families, grandparents, parents, children, all hunting, gathering, and surviving together. But more importantly, they were not isolated, despite what old textbooks may suggest. At many archaeological sites, researchers have found items that didn't originate locally. Seashells in mountain settlements. Obsidian from Turkey, found in Central Europe. Beads, pigments, and animal bones from distant regions. These artifacts show that prehistoric people had networks of exchange stretching across hundreds of kilometers. No coins, no merchants, but gifts, trust, and repeated interaction. Enough to form a functioning system. And within their small communities, they shared food, not just with family, but with the entire group. No one was left hungry if anyone else had something to eat. At Doni Vestinis in the Czech Republic, archaeologists discovered a massive cooking hearth, large enough to roast dozens of kilograms of meat at once. It was clearly built for communal feasts, likely when multiple groups gathered. Sharing wasn't just kindness, it was prehistoric insurance. Today I help you. Tomorrow, if I'm injured or starving, you'll help me. There were no laws, no written contracts, only obligations etched into collective memory. 
and upheld through honor, art ate, art, music, and symbolic thinking. When a Paleolithic human dipped their fingers into red ochre and painted on a cave wall, they weren't just creating shapes. They were telling a story. At Blombos Cave in South Africa, over 100,000 years ago, archaeologists found shells ground with ochre and color blocks smoothed flat like paint palettes, likely used to decorate bodies, mark surfaces, or express spiritual ideas. In Germany, a flute made from eagle bone, dating back over 43,000 years, still plays today. Its reconstructed sound is indistinguishable from traditional folk music, with pitch, rhythm, and intentional design. And deep inside caves like Lascaux and Altamira, humans left behind paintings of animals, figures, and abstract symbols, not in obvious places, but in the deepest, darkest corners. These weren't hunting notes. They were rituals, metaphors, and spiritual experiences. Part 9. Care, Medicine, and Human Compassion In a cave at Shanadar, Iraq, archaeologists discovered the skeleton of a Neanderthal missing his right arm, crippled in the left leg, blind in one eye, and with a deformed skull. And yet, he lived to around 40 years old, an advanced age for his time. That shouldn't have been possible, unless someone fed him, cleaned him, protected him from predators, and brought him along during migrations, every single day. Not because he could still hunt, not because he could still make tools, but because he was part of the group. Prehistoric humans did not abandon the sick. They did not discard the elderly. They did not treat the disabled as burdens. They kept the weak as living memory of the tribe. A blind man could tell stories. A crippled man could teach how to knack stone. An elder could remember the location of a water source from three seasons ago. And they didn't just care, they healed. On ancient teeth, bones, and tools, researchers have found traces of medicinal herbs, anti-inflammatory fungi, and willow bark, rich in salicylic acid, the active ingredient in modern aspirin. They used leaves to stop bleeding, clay to set broken limbs, and charcoal ash to disinfect wounds. They had no hospitals, but they had experience, observation, and compassion. To call them savage is to deny one of the most profoundly human traits ever to evolve, the capacity to care. Part 10. Lessons from the past for the present. We live in the age of satellites, AI, and lightning speed internet. But we also live in the age of climate change, social unrest, depression, loneliness, and identity crisis. We have everything, yet we've forgotten how to live rightly with the world. Paleolithic people didn't have solar panels, but they didn't deforest the planet. They didn't have food science, but they ate diversely and nutritiously. They had no written laws, but they knew how to share, support, and keep their word. They took only what was needed, no hoarding, no boasting. They hunted, but only when necessary. They ate, but also buried, honored, and thanked the creature they had killed. For millions of years, they lived sustainably, in harmony, and left behind not a single piece of plastic beneath the soil. They survived ice ages, volcanic winters, and droughts, not with domination, but with wisdom, patience, and collective strength. Today, as we face an uncertain future, maybe we don't need to return to the Stone Age. But we should remember how humans once lived without anything, and still lived beautifully, abundantly, and with deep humanity. So don't call them primitive, call them what they truly were, indigenous geniuses, masters of coexisting with nature without destroying it. We live among concrete, screens, and artificial lights, but deep in our DNA, we are still paleolithic. We carry the memory of mornings by the fire, nights filled with bone flute songs, and the scars of the oldest war on earth, the war to become human, they lived without dominating. They endured without destroying. They didn't need civilization because they laid its first foundation. So if life today feels too heavy, too disconnected, too lost, look to the past, not to return, but to remember 
how our ancestors once chose to live and survived because of it. If you want to uncover more forgotten truths about your ancient ancestors, subscribe to the channel so you never miss a story. Because the history of humanity didn't start with pyramids or empires. It began with a small fire, a story whispered in a cave, and a question that still echoes through time. What does it mean to be human?